Straight from the Mayor's Mouth, with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council. Hello everyone and welcome to Straight from the Mayor's Mouth. Hello there, Matt. How are you this morning? Yeah, good, thank you. It's actually still got a bit of a cold hanging around. It's been hanging around a bit longer than normal. It's so rare for you. It's so rare for you. Like, normally you are a, a picture of health, but uh, you're, you're still sort of struggling with this thing, Yeah, it's, it's just, it's one of those things that's just been hanging there for some reason. It hasn't mm. impacted what I do on a day-to-day basis, mm. but just the croaky voice, or maybe that's my radio voice I've well, got on the You're just sort of dropping the dulcet tones there in the sort of first <laughs> the listeners there today. Now, it obviously hasn't stopped you from uh, getting out on the bike uh, on your bike, because I happen to know this little video you posted during the week, uh, you had another little <laughs> encounter with a snake. I don't what know what's going go- on? I know. This is... We're, 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 that was just before winter. So a few days before winter, I like to get out and ride the bike. Track O'Reilly is a great spot to ride the bike, even mm. though I've been feeling a bit sick. Keep doing ex- exercise. Yep. And I'm just riding along minding my own business. And if it was spring going into summer, yeah, I've got my eyes peeled for snakes, whether you're out on the road, which sometimes yep. I do see them on the road, or on Track O'Reilly, any of those tracks around there, because it's a bit of bushland area where, where you can imagine some mm. snakes might live. But this was, again, a few days before winter. That's the thing that amazed me. I couldn't believe you actually saw a snake this time of year. Because normally right. they're all sort of tucked away. Just, hey, like, a bit of a uh, belly full of mice and whatever, and they're ready to go for the next three or four months of sleeping away. But they're still out and about. They are. And so it's a bit of a warning to everyone that yeah. they are out and about. Now, it was a baby one. I have run over ones before that have been full size, and they certainly are good for your training because they put your heart rate up. Get the old wind up, yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and this one still scared me because, again, they just there before you know it. And... Mm. Often they'll be out. So this was on Track O'Reilly along beside Obley Road. Yes. So it's bitumen along there. And obviously they're looking for some warmer areas. And they'll often be between the shade across the the track Mm. and the sunspot. So you're just seeing darker and lighter areas Mm. of the track with the shade across areas. And so they'll kind of get in some of those. You don't notice it until you're there either. You think it's a just a, another bit of the shade or maybe it's a stick. And before you know it, you're on it. And, of course, you're in the middle of the track, so yeah, there's you're not right much in you the can do the once you get near it. Oh, That's it. And so I rode over the top of this one again, and it just puts your heart <laughs> up in your mouth. And, you're, oh, oh, so. <laughs> and for the sake of all the listeners out there, the snake was fine. It uh, managed to sort of wilder off after what's in it, sort of waddled away and well, happy the, days, the light, away. The light I've got on the front of my bike is a, a brand called Cyclic, C-Y-C-L-I-Q. And they market their particular brand around good lights with cameras built in so oh, that yeah. if something happens out on the road, a bit like having cameras in your car, you can capture some accident. Like happens. a motion sense sort of thing. Almost. No, no, like a video. It's a, like a proper video thing. Yeah, okay. it's a, it's yeah, a full yeah, video. Yeah. Yeah. And so I've got a cyclic light on the front and a cyclic tail light on the back. And so you've got video on the front of the back. So I, I have got the video of me seeing it. Uh, a couple of meters beforehand, going, ah! <laughs> that's it, I'm over the top of it. And then you see the back. If you haven't seen it, folks, it's worth a laugh. It's a good watch. <laughs> that's right. Thank you, at my expense. Uh, but then you've got the back video as well, so you then see the, the snake scamper off. So Oh, there you go. I'm pretty confident the snake was okay. I think my little weight like those little disclosures they put up at the end of a yeah, movie, you know, no snakes were harmed in the <laughs> filming of this video. That's right. <laughs> I reckon the snake probably got as much of a scare as I got a scare. And again, being a baby snake probably goes, okay, let let me make a mental note. Don't hang around on that track because you get right. people riding their pushbikes along there. <laughs> <laughs> now, last week, mate, uh, we talked about um, the, I suppose, the scholarship situation where that's where uh, Dubbo Regional Council gives uh, scholarships out to the CSU graduating students or, or the students who are going to eventually graduate. This week, you had the great pleasure of actually going along to a CSU graduation ceremony. So uh, it's always good fun to go along and watch uh, these young ones and not so young ones as well graduate. Well, that is the interesting thing, actually. The people that go through CSU, I remember the very first O-Week event that I went to speak at and welcome and have a great time and all the rest of it. And I remember thinking in my mind, oh, right, I'm going to go back to my O-Week and what we're up to in that O-Week. And I, I was actually 17 when I first went to uni, so you know, you're young. You're young, you've got, you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you've got full of life and you're all excited about it all and everything. And I'm thinking about what I'm going to say to these similar age people. Mm. And I'm looking around the audience and I'm going, gee, there's a lot of parents in the audience today. <laughs> That's really good they're supporting their kids, but I better be careful what I say. I don't want to get too carried away here. And I spoke to one of the people at uni beside me, and I said, wow, a lot of parents there. I said, no, 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 this is just for students. I'm going, but look, there's people out there, like, mid-30s, some of their 40, in their 40s. So, you know, they're students. And so CSU certainly mm. does seem to have a different cohort to my memory from university. Yep. And so you do get, obviously, people a bit older and maybe taking a different tack in their life. Mm. Maybe in some instances you've got some – people who started a family, raised a family, the kids have all grown up now and they've gone, right, now I never got that chance to go yeah, and yeah. 
get a degree or maybe I never got a chance to do what exactly or, or I wanted to do, so let's go and do that now. So yeah, wonderful though. When, 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 you, know, you see people like that. I always sort of find the fact that it's, it's never easy. I think too for an adult uh, to go back in to do some type of post grad education, is it? Like it, it's especially when life gets in the way, so to speak. So for anybody who's out there, you know, of a middle age sort of age, or anyone for that matter who sort of uh, uh, is has to sort of look after themselves and their family, and you know the rates and paying the normal sort of bills, and then decide to sort of go back in and do university with probably a full time job, a lot of them, at least a part time, at least. Mm. It's a great, great effort. So yeah, hats off to anybody who does that. Hats off, literally in this case. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so there were forty. Seven graduates on uh, during the week at the RSL Club Theatrette. They've had them at the Civic Centre, the the Devo Regional Theatre and Convention mm. Centre previously. Not sure why they moved to the theatre at this time, but it was quite a, a nice, cosy setting, quite an intimate setting there. So, forty seven graduates, mostly education, like lower education, primary school, uh, early childhood education, yep. nursing, and that's where obviously CSU has its strength. Mm. Obviously, a lot of females graduating, and I'm just going from memory here, out of the 47, I think I can remember seeing two, I could be wrong on that, two males. Is that right? And that right. was about it. So, again, yeah. with the occupations, with the degrees they've got on offer there, yeah. then it does tend to lend itself more towards females, but mm. again, they're not discriminating against males. No, it's just no. the way that, that but you really want to, to see more blokes, don't you, back into the system with that, especially in like teaching and nursing. There's two great examples where we want to sort of see more blokes getting back into it again, which would be fabulous. Well, it's, it's whatever is there. The great part about it is mm. now that we know that people aren't discriminated against because of their mm. sex, and there obviously mm. has been a lot of that in years gone by, but now it's you want to do a nursing degree, you want to do a teaching, early childhood, or whatever, then you're not impeded by mm. whatever sex you happen to be. So mm. that was fantastic. It's great to see everyone in the room and obviously parents and, and friends that are there as well. They're all excited. And, of course, it's just – it's a real buzz. You've yeah. achieved something significant. So it's a real buzz Absolutely. in the room there. Yeah. So, yeah, anyway, well done to all those graduates. Yeah. I, I think it is a fantastic achievement. But it's also a fantastic concept that we've got a university education right here mm. in our community. So people from our community and people from – Further out west, and you even get people from Sydney who mm. want to have a regional experience have got that ability to get their degree here in Dubbo as well. Well, congratulations to all the graduates. Now, after the graduation ceremony, you also attended a dinner, I see here. Now, this was the CSU Dubbo Regional Consultative Committee. It's quite a title. <laughs> What's the purpose of this group? This is a group that I've been on for a long time now, and I think it actually stopped meeting for some time, they right. changed their model. But what they really want to do from CSU is just have some people in the community, people that are interested in good outcomes for the university, just to get some feedback about what's happening, how are things working, how are things progressing, what can we do. So essentially, they'll normally have some elected representatives. So for example, we had Phyllis Miller, the Mayor of Forbes, who is on this committee. Yep. You've got Ken Keith, who's a councillor at Parks still, but long-term mayor of Park. So, yep. again, it's not just about Dubbo, and that's yep. obvious. You've got other people in in terms of on that committee, so Dougal Saunders from mm. a, a state government perspective. So the idea here is meet on a regular basis and just talk about what's happening, how are things progressing, what, what are we hearing in the community, what mm. are people outside the university, because there's obviously some university staff that sit on this as well, but what are people in the general community hearing? Because when you're in the organisation, you don't always mm. hear everything from outside. So I suppose uh, the question, what are people hearing? Like what's what's the general sort of feel about CSU right now in regards to it? Well, there, there's no doubt about it. I'm not telling any secrets here that numbers are lower. 47 graduates mm. is good, but there's certainly been higher numbers in the past. Even at O-Week, the number of people who start at university is lower than it has been in previous years. Mm. So that's a concern for CSU. And some of it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You reduce the number of courses mm. because you haven't got the same number of people coming to university, and then when you've got fewer courses, less people come mm. to the university. Yeah. So that's a problem. Do you go and make an investment and put a lot more courses on and then hope that you then build up over time? How long can you sustain that for? Mm. I think one of the things, probably part of the messaging that I certainly talked on the night about, was the understanding that we do have a university presence here in Dubbo. Mm. And I think this is a really important part. If I go to Bathurst, then Bathurst has had a long tradition 
uh, I think it used to be called the Mitchell College Mitchell of College Advanced, Advanced Education. Education. There you go. I Thank remember you. it well. Yeah, so, so that's where I started from. There you go. So when people are in Bathurst, they know there's a higher education mm. institute there. If they're in Armidale, they know that it's there because it's been there. It's got good numbers there, been there for a long period of time, and people know that it's an option for them. One of the questions that I have for CSU in terms of having discussions around this consultative committee is, is there a way that we can better illustrate to the community that you've got an option when you're at school mm. in Dubbo or in Burke or Bree or Walgett that you've got this option of education at a university level here in Dubbo? Mm. And I think that in itself is fantastic. Mm. For some people, it's a bit too scary or a bit too expensive to go to Sydney or Wollongong or Newcastle, but coming to Dubbo is a great option. So just getting that in to our general mm. psyche, I think that's a really important part yeah. that we could do. What's the general feedback from CSU in regards to this? Because like, we have spoken uh, quite a few times about this, is mm. the, the fact that is, is CSU, do you feel as though that they're embedded into the future of, uh, of running a university here in Dubbo? Is, is that sort of part of their long-term plan still, do you think? I think absolutely the, they want to run a university here in Dubbo. The question I have is about the size and the number mm. of courses and whether we could get some sort of specialty. So, for example, they do veterinary studies, but that's in Wagga because obviously you've got a lot of hands-on components, mm. so it's hard to do that and all dental, remote. sort of like in Orange and that sort of thing. You know, they, and they've got they, medical. Say, yeah, there's yeah, specialist medical areas range. in certain areas, but yeah. we don't really have that here, do we? Well, we've got the dentistry school, which is a combination between Sydney University and Charleston University, so that's mm. good. So there's a little bit of that there, probably not huge numbers going through that. Is there something that we could specialise in? Is it just mm. about nursing? Is it just about early childhood? Is there something else we could have? You could have some good numbers. So they're committed to Dubbo. I don't mm. have any question marks about that whatsoever. The number of courses, the number of students, that's where I'd like to see more. And I suppose I'd mm. like to see, and maybe it's a bit old-fashioned from me, but I'd like to see more of the, the university campus type education. So many people now, and we talked about it before, yep with people that are a bit older, a bit more advanced in their lives, they're doing it from their lounge room. They're doing it mm. from a cafe in Dubbo. They're not necessarily doing it on campus. That's what you sort of, yeah, remember we talked about like their online presence is very strong. Mm. They have a very strong online presence. But as you say, their on-campus presence, not so strong. Is, is And that's what you're saying, is you'd like to sort of see a bit more on campus. I'd like, that's me personally, I'd like to see mm. a bit more of that on campus. Is CSU believed in that as well, or is that their thoughts? Or? Well, it's a challenge for them because they do offer exceptional online courses and that's been a great advantage during the pandemic mm. when other universities were trying to work at how they could deliver their courses online and CSU said well that's our bread and butter we know how to do that so it was fantastic during that period and I think just mm. in general they see that as one of their great strengths there's a fantastic main building up there at CSU there is accommodation up there there's accommodation facilities I know our Rotary Club Rotary Club of Dubbo South contributed many years ago financially to building one of those accommodation facilities so there's mm. The, the pieces in place there to have a good online, oh, sorry, a good on-campus experience, but it just seems to lend itself more towards online. And I know mm. an offer I make every year to Charles Street University and the University of Sydney is I say, I want to see some sporting teams, some touch footy, some netball, some indoor cricket, whatever. Mm. I want to see some teams that are called... University of Sydney or Charles Sturt University or the nurses of Charles Sturt University or whatever yep. it is. Yep. And I, and not me, the community, the like council, I will pay for your uniforms mm. as long as you're named that team. So name the University yep. of Sydney something, the Charles Sturt University something. As you say, to, to give it more of a, a community focus. I uh, want people. In that sense. So people do know it's here. I want people playing a game of yeah, touch yeah. footy and saying, oh, you're the Charles Sturt University. Devils or whatever yeah, you might yeah. be, whatever team. Oh, right, so you're at uni here, are you? Yeah, mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. And then that person has a discussion with someone else. And each week you look mm -hmm. at the draw and you go, oh, this week we're playing the CSU Devils. Yep. And so It's exactly what it is in at a lot of places around, isn't it? Like I know Bathurst still does that. And certainly when I was going through, we used to have uh, play in hockey. We were the Mitchell College team. That was uh, our team. We'd sort of run our way around in C grade or something down there, what it was <laughs> in the freezing cold of Bathurst in the middle of winter. But, yeah, I remember it well. Yeah, so that type of thing where I just want it to be – embedded in our psyche. Mm. It's probably not, and again, Bathurst probably has more of this, but it's probably not going to have, with the age of the students, people running down the main street in their academic gowns with a egg balance on a spoon <laughs> with some pub crawl or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And so for people in the community in Bathurst, they might see that, and, oh, 
they hear those university students again being mm. out and being silly, but in their mind, they're thinking about university students. Absolutely, that's we, right. We don't see yeah. that in Dubbo, and I'm not saying they should go and have a pub crawl or they should drink too much alcohol, but I just think in terms of getting profile. involved in the community. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah well, so. let's, let's, let's hope it comes to fruition. I think it's a great idea. We've spoken a little bit about this one, uh, Matt, in regards to the, the homeless camp that was set up down there at Track O'Reilly uh, at Regan Park, uh, or along Track O'Reilly at Regan Park. Uh, it looks as though it's no longer there. So what's what's finally happened here? Well, it's been a, a tough journey from a council perspective. We don't have necessarily the authority to go in and say, move along. We're not the police. Yep. We can't arrest people there. In fact, the police can't move them along just for being there. Mm. They've got to be committing a crime. We've certainly had is discussions. Is there a no camping sort of part of that though? So like we've introduced a... that. We've added ah, okay, no right. camping so to the area So that's just recently there. been introduced, has it? That's something we've introduced because of this camp that's yeah, been down right, there. Okay. And again, it puts our rangers in a pretty tough position mm. when you've got people that are probably, possibly impacted by drugs or antisocial behaviour and then to put our rangers in in the firing line, mm. and they're not really equipped to do that. If you're a police officer, mm. you've got the training and you've got the tools, you've got a taser, you've, you've got a gun if yeah, it gets yeah, that drastic. Yeah. So you've got all that training and you've got the ability to handle those situations. Our rages are not really set up to be in confrontational situations. Mm, no. They're set up to do certain things and infer, enforce certain laws, but... It's a tough gig. It's Absolutely. a tough gig. We've been working very hard with various government agencies and NGOs, non-government organisations as well, to try and work out ways that we can help these people and rather than just go down there and put a bulldozer through it, because mm. all they do is set up another camp 50 metres up the road, that doesn't really solve the problem. So we've been talking to them, we've had our staff down there just engaging in some conversations with people at the camp. We've been trying our best to get the various state government agencies and NGOs involved. We've been talking to the police and they've been very supportive of us as well. And in the end, we got to the stage where we gave them notice with the support of the police to say, you've got a certain number of weeks to move out and then that's it. We're going to have to dismantle the okay. camp. Yep. And it got to that point during the week, the deadline was hit. And what was good was the main protagonist, the main organiser of this camp mm. was no longer there. He moved along a few days earlier. Right, okay. Don't know where to, and that's a bit of a concern as well because yeah, yeah, okay. he can just easily set up somewhere else. Yep. But once that was done and there was no one else left there, then basically our staff went down there and cleaned up that area. Mm. I'm not convinced it is our job to do it, but it didn't look great and people mm. in the community were saying, can you do something about it? Once there were no people there, once there was no confrontation, once there was no one to try and move along, mm. then we basically cleaned up that area there. So if you go for a, a walk or a bike ride or a run along there, keep out a night for the snakes, mm, but mm. you'll certainly see that that area there now is cleaned up. And I, I think that's a, a good thing. We've had to support one of those people by saying, almost hold the hand to take them along to some of the, the various state government agencies to try and find somewhere for this person to live, both short term and long term. Yep. One of the things that I suspect some of these people don't have the life skills to manage a home. Mm. And when I talk about managing a home, I mean just things like having a, a home provided to them by the state government where they might have to pay some electricity. Mm. They might have to go out and buy some food that on some welfare payments, for example, manage that money that comes in on those welfare payments. Mm. Don't spend it all when you first get it on some alcohol or some smokes. Go out and manage that process and and live, if you like, mm. in terms of the normal expectations of society, I'm not convinced they've all got the skills to do that. And that's mm. where I would hope that some of the state government organisations are helping these people. But it's a pretty tough gig for anyone yeah. because some of these people are fairly aggressive. Some of these people have burnt their bridges with all of the other mm. agencies. So they're not getting help anymore. Mm. So it's tough. But there's, there's probably a lot of mental health issues, I'm sure. So the link with, with a lot of these guys as yeah. well. Um, so it certainly sounds like at, at this point in time then, so the, the, the camp's been, you know, uh, taken away. There's, there are now signs up, apparently, is there? In regards to, so there's no camping along any of the areas there now. So that's all officially now been set up there. Is, is, that, is that right? Are there signage we, up? We put point? signs up previously. So okay. those signs were there. But again, I'm not sure the type of people that end up in these camps are necessarily so law-abiding that no, they see a right. sign and say, oh, no camping. We just better not go and but set up here. does that now give more power now to the police to, to move people on? Or No, the, the police still don't have 
move on powers per se. But yes, and again, one of the, the problems we've got here is that if you move someone on, so we've got a site that says no camping, you can't be here, so the police move them along. Mm. Well, they just set up somewhere else. And so it's not really a solution, and that's part of the problem that we've got. And part of the reason I think that the, the various agencies involved like to try and find mm. a solution for these people rather than just, hey, you can't be there. Yeah. Get away from there. But as you say, even the solution's quite complicated. Very complicated because yeah. you've got people that have got very complicated yeah. lives and very complicated yeah. mindsets. So there's no easy solution to no. all of this. No. And we would love to be able to say, yes, we've got something to help. Is there some sort of long-term solution we can come up with? Not sure. Mm. Even if there was more housing available, I'm talking about more government-provided housing, more social housing available, they're still going to be able to manage themselves. They're yeah. still going to be able to manage their day-to-day lives, and mm. some of these people simply don't have the capabilities to do that. And there's no doubt in my mind that some of these people commit crimes with one ambition, and that is to be locked up. Mm. When they're locked up, they've got a roof over their head, they've got three meals a day, they know they're relatively safe, mm. and they can survive. Mm. So that's, again, I don't I don't think some of them commit crimes just because they need the money or mm. because that's their life of crime chosen, I think some of them commit crimes well, because they want to be locked I up. I think there's may well have been a classic example of that during the week with those young kids who uh, you know, broke in and took the car out of the uh, the police compound and it's like, boy, oh boy, if ever you want to be locked up, you've just done exactly that. You know, yeah, like yeah. it's almost it's so glaringly obvious that it's so brazen. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. So a situation like that you just gotta go, Yeah, what sort of life must you be leading if that's your option? And if you're doing that you are screaming out oh, for absolutely. help, I think. Yeah, I agree. Now, speaking of signage, um, I do love this. I, I was walking along uh, Tracker Riley, the area there, the other day, and also it sort of extends a fair way now. There are these new signs that have been put up there, tourist signs, um, sort of giving instructions as to how far to next destination and, and next destination point is this and all those type of things. They're fabulous. If you haven't seen them, go along a bit of a walk along the Tracker Riley track and, and you'll see them. They're all over the place. There seems to be quite a few of them. So talk me through this, Matt. This is a great initiative. And, and how did this come about and where did the funding come from? So quite a few of them. You're right, 34. Oh, wow, well, I haven't signs. seen that many. But okay, 34, <laughs> there's a lot. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So technically they're called wayfinding signs. So Wayfinding I'd, signs. I'd call them directional signs, yeah, no, no, information so, so, signs. Yeah, yeah. But technically, they're called wayfinding signs. I like the way they look too. They're, they're, you know, they really are aesthetically very pleasing too to look at. They're not just simply a sign. There's nice timber work done and all that sort of stuff too. They look really good. You may remember the old signs were the red and green, and that's going back to Dubbo City Council Mm. days. And those signs were installed back around 1996, so they'd been there for a long time, and they were okay. But they'd started to fade. Mm. They started to wear out. There needed to be some work done on those and some updates because Tracker Riley has been extended over the years. A mm. Shibble Bridge had been put in uh, maybe 10 years ago or so. So mm. things had changed a little bit around there. So definitely we've been looking at changing those. And in fact, Councillor Richard Ivey had brought a notice of motion forward to Council some time ago now to do a sign audit around Dubbo because there'd been signs that he'd noticed yeah, that still had reference yes. to Tony Kelly, the yep. former general manager, that's right. now passed away, unfortunately, yeah. but that's going back a long time ago. I reckon Tony was last general manager around 2003. Oh, good memory. Maybe that's, 2004. That's, yeah. No, it would be 2004. Yeah. He was still general manager, but not long after that. Yep. So that's obviously a long time ago. Yeah, a lot of signs that said Dubbo City Council, some that had the wrong directions. That's mm. over the whole LJ. It cost money to replace all of those. Mm. But we went looking for various funding, and we did manage to get $250,000 funding from the Australian Government's Local Roads and Community Infrastructure Program. Okay, yep. yeah, So that was good. So there's 13.65 kilometres of Tracker Riley shared pathway around the river, mm. which is a, a good length. And then again, the 34 signs that I mentioned there. And they have got a lot of information on them. They've got information to various next points. There is one that's got a mistake if you want to go looking for a mistake that we will get fixed up very shortly. What, that's, that's like trying to find where's Wally. <laughs> 34 well, signs and one mistake. I'll, I'll give you 13 a and a half kilometres of walking around and all that reading. <laughs> and it was actually, it's a chocolate bar for the first person who finds it. <laughs> well, <laughs> that would already be awarded because I found out about it because I had a resident send me a message to oh, say, is that right? here's a sign and here's a mistake on it. And I must admit I... Was it a spelling error or what was it? Kind of. Oh, I, okay. I ride past these signs on my bike, so yep. I'm going along at 30 k's an hour, for example, so I don't stop and actually have a look at each sign. Yeah. But there was one there where well, the signs have got 
distance notifications yes. so that it might tell you where the zoo is or where the CBD mm. is or where a, a car park is that it would have so many kilometres or so many metres. Mm. And you can see the sign rider doing it where there'd be sometimes it would have a K in there for a kilometre and sometimes it would just have 750 metres or 1.8 kilometres. If you look at the one near the weir, you'll notice that that says that the Regan Park car park is 1.8 metres from that sign. <laughs> <laughs> it should be 1.8 kilometres, uh, but obviously we're not doing the Two steps there, clock. folks. That's it. That's yeah, all it that's right. So yeah. keep an eye for that one. Have a look yeah, at that yeah. one there. There you go. It may be fixed up by now. I, I haven't checked it for the last week or so, but that's certainly one there. But they're quite comprehensive, and they've got a good map there as well. Oh, they, yeah. They, they really do look fantastic. And I know one of the things that I do, if I turn up at another location, another place that I might be staying at overnight, I might... I don't always travel with my bike, but I might just go for a run around somewhere. Mm. And you're always looking to see where you can do it. And I do appreciate when I do go somewhere and there's a sign that tells me yeah. this loop here, this is so many kilometres, oh, good, I'll do that loop. Or I can see the distance to that, right, mm. I'll, I'll just go for a mm. run to there. So it's actually quite nice. So anyone that turns up on these, and I've, I've been stopped on Tracker Riley numerous times mm. from people, you'll be riding along on your bike and you'll see someone kind of putting their hand up until you pull over, uh, you okay? Yep, but I'm just trying to find yes. to... Here or the nearest toilets. Yeah, nearest no, toilets yeah. or where's yep. the CBD or how far to that. Yep. So you do get people to ask that. So now, hopefully, with these signs out there, people will be able to look at those and they'll, oh, right, I can see where I go now and they can look at a bit mm. of the map. I mean, you could pull out your phone and look on your phone as well, but you might just find it easy to, to look at one of these signs or mm. ask someone about it. And just knowing, as you say, toilets, they don't always show yeah, up on right. your phone, for example. Oh, and, and aesthetically, when you're walking along and you're sort of you're seeing these things, that they look lovely, and it's also, yeah, another little bit of a attraction to sort of look at as you're walking along. Yeah, and you're right, they're quite impressive. Mm. Three planks of timber mm. with the signage attached to those three planks of timber, so they do look pretty good and Hopefully, long lasting as well. Hopefully, they'll be there for many I'd decades so. to come. They'll probably outlast you and me. Now, I know you're keen to see your vision realised in regards to the REACT. Remember, we talked about the REACT. So, this is a, a, an initiative we talked about uh, going back, oh, probably last year, I think we first uh, talked about the REACT Centre. Um, now, we discussed the preliminary business case and the fact that it's uh, a bit of an idea that you've sort of uh, put forward there. And it certainly sounds as though it's getting a bit of, uh, bit of backing from some of the, uh, uh, the groups around. Where are we up to with this? Is this actually really starting to take fruition? So we've now hired consultants. Oh, okay. So we are really are moving forward. Yeah, because we've got money from proponents. Three of the proponents have come forward and they've given us $50,000 each towards the consultancy Wonderful. process. That's awesome. So not costing council a cent on this process. And those consultants have now been engaged and they know that time's of the essence. So they're meeting with various stakeholders. And of mm-hmm. course, I met with them during the week just to have a discussion and just talk about what my vision is, not to say that's the final solution, not to say that's the only solution, but I just wanted to give them an idea of, of my vision and, mm. and what I was thinking when I was... Well, so, so for the benefit of the listeners who may not know what we're talking about, so what is the REACT Centre again? So REACT stands for Renewables, Education and Career Training mm. and then Centre, so REACT Centre. And the idea here, if I go back a few steps then, the idea came to me when I was thinking about what can we have as a result of our, our renewables in this area that's long-lasting, long-term. Now, there'll be lots of activity. We know there'll be between, say, $10 billion and $20 billion spent mm. on renewables in the central west of Rana Renewable Energy Zone. That will occur over the next, say, 10 years and, and probably maybe over 15, but it'll tail off. There'll be lots of activity for the next seven, then slowly tail off or tail off over the years after that. So that's fantastic. There'll be employment, obviously. There'll be people using various trades, local trades, there'll be community benefit funds. And those mm. community benefit funds might extend for 25 years, maybe even 30 years. But I really wanted something that would be not for a few years during construction, not for mm. 25 years during an agreement, but forever, yeah. if you yeah. like. And the examples I started thinking about, one was the Parks Telescope. Yes. You look yes. at the Parks Telescope, about 100,000 people a year visit the Visit Information Centre mm. there. Then I thought about Snowy Hydro Scheme, You've got about 150,000 people a year go to the Snowy, Snowy Hydro Discovery Centre. Yeah, right. I'm thinking if we had 100,000 visitors a year mm. coming to Wellington, that would fundamentally change the economy of Wellington. Yep. yep. What can we do to do that? Yep. And then I started thinking more about some viewing platforms. At Ningen and Nevertire, there are large solar farms. 
and both of those have a viewing platform. Mm. It's a platform that you walk up onto and look across solar panels. There That's it. That's it. That's all it is. Yeah, and yeah. people visit these yeah, yeah. to look at those. So yeah. I thought surely if we've got somewhere that's got a bunch of solar panels, a bunch of wind turbines, surely we can do something there yeah. from a visitor experience process, even the Parks Telescope. Yep. The dish is a, I don't know, 50-ton dish that yeah, sits there. That's right. And if it does ever move, it moves very slowly. So it's not <laughs> as if it's a yes. riveting, exciting thing to look at there, but they've done very well mm. in building that visitor experience. So my vision started off as a visitor experience centre, somewhere where you'd have tourists come along. And as we started talking about that, it was quickly realised that some of the proponents have a fair bit of training they need to do for the people that work Mm. on their solar mm. farms, on their wind farms, etc. A whole range of different skills are needed, whether it be electricians or people that have got trade skills. Mm. Other skills are needed that are just basic. If you've got trade-like skills, you can participate in this. But they all need training of some description. Mm. So let's work out if we can add training to that. And that's when I think the That's proponents, where they sort of started to jump on board. Yeah, that's they? when they got yeah. a bit excited yeah. about it all. Yeah. So I had the chance to talk to the consultants and I said, what... I will feel like we've achieved is significant if in 20 years' time we've got this centre. Sure, it might be doing some training still, but mm. most of the construction will have finished here, so there might be some training trickling through there. But if we get 100,000 visitors a year mm. through here, then we will have achieved something significant, mm. long-lasting for the economy of Wellington as a result of the res. Tourism, training, educational purposes. Yep. Throw and the three of them together, and as you say, if one, like the training side of things, eventually finishes up after 20-odd years, after they've had enough training from it, but uh, you've still got this other option set in place there that would, by that stage, I'm sure, be well known around the place. And I did talk to them about the whole idea of a Questacon-style mm. experience in there. Like and an interactive type thing. That yeah, type yeah, of thing, yeah. and, and I must admit, I'm a bit of a fan of Questacon. In fact, yes. when I was at uni, my first year of uni, I... I don't think I've ever been to Questacon, but I heard about Questacon and I sent them a, a letter and said, hey, I'm studying science. I'd love to come and work at mm. Questacon in the holidays. And they said, sorry, we only take people from Canberra or right. maybe only from ANU, like yeah, students yeah. from ANU. We only have a program. Of, I said, well, that's not very good. So I went back and forth a few times right. and, uh, and dug my heels in and finally yeah. they said, sure. So, I so was you the, showed your persistence at a young age. <laughs> there right. it was. I, I was officially the first ever explainer, as they were called, right. a first ever explainer employed from outside of Canberra, outside of the ACT. Yep. Uh, and so I did that in, in some of the holidays oh, there. Well and so I, I love the concept there. And that's when it was back, I think it was originally in the Ainsley Public School, so not in the wonderful facility right. they've got right. now, which yeah. was a yep. bicentenary project, yep. but that was in the old school there. So that type of thing where you can have school kids come in, mm. not just school kids, anyone come in and, and be involved. Yeah. You, you have a little wind turbine that you blow on and you see it turn and see how that generates electricity or you, mm. you shine a light on a solar panel, mm. but just that education. So from a government perspective, the state and the federal governments have both got a job to do mm. in educating the, the community about renewables. Some people out there want nuclear, some people want coal. The governments have said mm. we're going renewables. So they want, hopefully, some education. The state and federal, are they on board with this? Have you had any uh, you know, sort of uh, feedback from any of these guys? Absolutely. Philosophically, definitely on board. Yeah. But we've got to turn philosophy into dollars. Yep. So we want to get them on board with dollars as well. Yeah. 150000 bucks in consulting. There's an well, option that's there Well, that's from right proponents. Now. That's not from government. That's from proponents. Yeah, wow, well, okay. Yeah, we yeah. want larger chunks of money from the government. Yeah, yeah, no, of course. <laughs> but at least now you've got a chance now with this to sort of to really come through with a very professionally uh, uh, set up proposal, I suppose. Well, that's the idea, to, to make the numbers stack up. So yeah. We want these consultants to go and say, well, well here's his vision. Yeah. Well, that's great, but we can't go and get millions of dollars that we need for this on a bit of a vision that mm. I thought, hey, mm. let's have what Parks has got. Yeah. We need something more fundamental. So what training is required? What is the training need for renewables over the next 10 years, and where is that training needed at? Mm. We need to break down that information to make a case for the training. Mm. What is the potential for education? How many school groups could you get through here? All these sort of things. Mm. What's the cost of the building? What's the cost of running it? Who's going to run it? These are all the fundamental questions that, yeah. again, I haven't got the answers to, but that's why we've got consultants. Have you had a thought about where you'd like to place this? I'm, and, and again, it was good to talk to the consultants because they started off by saying, we've looked at one site and we've worked out that the site is the most important thing. And I went, no, 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 no. The site is not the most important thing. The model, how we deliver all this, is the absolutely crucial thing. If mm. you have a great site but you don't get the model right mm. no it's terrible so mm. you need to get 
the activities, you need to get the experience, you need to get the education, you need to get the training. That is crucial. And the only thing that I said within the location is it needs to be within a two kilometre radius of Wellington. Mm. If we look at the Parks Telescope, the only complaint people of parks have about the Parks Telescope. Just got out of town. Just, mm. yeah. So if, for example, someone from Dubbo was visiting the zoo, they heard about the dish and they went, oh, we might duck over there. Mm. They might drive across to the dish and then, oh, we won't keep going into parks. We'll just turn around and come back. Mm. So just that little bit too far away. It, don't get me wrong. It's still great for parks. Yeah. But it would be just a little bit better if it was closer. So I said the crucial thing here to me would be within a two-kilometre radius. Now, there is a site. It's the old soil conservation site which would be a perfect site for it. Right. It's a hill, so you've got a bit of height yeah. to be able to look out across the various activities that are happening down there. It's owned by one of the proponents in terms okay. of one of the solar providers there, and they don't have a specific need for it, so yeah. do they really yeah. need it long term? It's got an old building there. That building wouldn't be suitable. That building would be, I'd guess, at least 50 years old, maybe mm. older than that. Mm. It's the old soil conservation building there. Not being used, so that would be a site, but I did say... Don't get hung up on that site. Don't mm. put everything into this must be the site and let's start doing planning around this site because for whatever reason that site may not work out. But within two kilometre radius of Wellington, I think would be crucial. So if you're in Wellington, it's only a couple of k's to duck out there and have a look yep. at that. Yep. If it's 20 k's out of Wellington, uh, mm. no, I might just go through to Dubbo, I might keep going through to Orange, but two k's, oh, oh, we can duck out there. That won't yep. take long. Let's have a look at that. So I think that's a crucial part of the equation. Ideally, we need to make this happen quickly mm. because there are several reses. There's five reses around New South Wales. There are yep. reses across the rest of the nation. You don't want any others sort of jumping on board and taking your idea and setting it up? Well, the training is a crucial part there. Mm. I think there would be only so many available locations for training. Mm. If we're there first, then training as the other reses roll out, training would be, well, we've already got one of those down in Wellington. Yeah, yeah. Let's send our people we'll down just there. we building that one down mm. there, yeah. So I think the good part is they're talking to stakeholders, They've certainly got an idea of that vision. They did say to me at the end of it, well, that's great. We now, we, we, we've understood the concept, but we haven't really been able to grab hold of the vision. Mm. Now we understand the vision. And to me, the critical part, the judgment of whether this is successful is not really known until 20 years' time, mm. but that is we have 100,000 visitors a year coming through this centre in 20 years' time. That's when I'll be able to look back from my old person's home. And you'll be sitting up and say, rocking away at your chair saying, yeah, yeah that worked. Reading that the good. council report going 101,000 <laughs> visitors through, through that. Oh, great. I'll ring you and say, Mark, well, yeah, that, that's that, right. that worked yeah, out, yeah, that didn't did, it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well done. Yeah, right now, with the recent announcement of the federal government money for the Radjuri Cultural Tourism Centre, we had a bit of a brief discussion uh, about the money the council received to build Barden Park. Now, this is the athletics facility, and, of course, when it was built way back there in 2014, we talked about uh, how that money came about to, to build that wonderful facility. It's always great, isn't it, when we get council receiving money for new infrastructure. But you've also had to maintain that infrastructure. And that's a really important part, I think, about any uh, initiatives that come into place, even the new REACT you know, Centre, if that comes in. There's obviously going to be money eventually to keep the upgrading of that sort of thing sort of going. Um, has there been a recent project just finished there at Barton Park as part of like an infrastructure uh, job that had to be done? Certainly the resurfacing of Barton Park is something we knew from day one we'd have to start putting money aside for. So, so there's been some resurfacing now done there? Correct. And okay. it's been closed down for several months while that resurfacing has actually been occurring. Mm -hmm. Now, it was opening in 2014, as you correctly said, yep. and we always knew at that point in time, in about 10 years, we would need to do some resurfacing. And for a few reasons, one of the things we did when we built Barden Park was we went on a tour of other international standard athletics facilities. So we went down to places like Sydney and looked at, places there at Homebush and, and other centres. And some of the feedback we got, and I remember being on some of those trips, some of the feedback we got from some other facility managers was when you build whatever you're building, make sure you put money in the budget to maintain it. And we looked at one facility, for example, mm -hmm. in lanes one and two on that track, the track had worn through. Right. So the yep. top surface of the track had worn through to the bottom layer. And they said, this year, this is now not good enough for us to hold international standard meets mm -hmm. Some athletes won't run or train on this track now because of the danger yeah, that wow. this change in surface has. Mm. So make sure you keep that in mind. And so we've mm. always said from day one, we need to start putting money in our budget. Now, one of the things that's really interesting when you look at finances of council 
is that we have depreciation as an expense and it sometimes makes our figures not look as good. Mm. A normal business would use depreciation as a tax deduction but not to make their P&L look bad. Mm. We've got certain specific requirements around how we've got to report our finances and you've got depreciation that if it's all a perfect world, Mm. then that depreciation reflects the wear and tear on that asset so that you are basically accounting for the cost of replacement of that asset. Sure. So from yep. day one, from 2014, we said we need to start putting money aside to resurface this track. It'll be in our finances in terms of depreciation, but we actually need the money sitting mm. there mm. in about 10 years' time. So it's, like, it's allocated funds. This hasn't come from a um, like a recent, oh, we have to rob Peter to, to pay Paul, so to speak. We've actually had the money sitting aside here for this purpose. Well, yes, but it gets better than that. Oh, okay. <laughs> but wait, there's more. It's like the old big Kev ad. That's right, because what we did with this was we put the money aside and we went through that process to make sure we had the money there. Mm -hmm. But, of course, we're always looking out for grant opportunities. And we did manage to get approximately $1.06 million for this particular resurfacing. So it meant the money that we were putting aside. We had the money set aside, Mm. but then we got some money from one of our... uh, State government. State government. Okay, state government money. So a million dollars came through from state government. So. That's wonderful. Like, yeah. that's, that's almost like saying, okay, we've got, uh, we're going to put this money away for this great European trip we're going to go on. All of a second, at last uh, minute, uh, oh, suddenly got all this money. Sort of came that's in from right. a great friend of mine who decided to drop 30000 bucks for me. Thanks very much. Exactly right. So are you talking about me now? Is that the hint? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Don't tell the listeners too much, but yes, thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> so that was fantastic that we got the money in the state government. Yeah. The other good part, of course, is now we've got, obviously, the facility – done, the resurfacing finished, How good the new that? line marking has been done, and the just in time, for the winter school athletic season has just kicked yeah, off. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. I think, and uh, we've got something ridiculous like, I think there's about 34 different carnivals wow. that are booked in already. And they would be banking up, I'd suggest, having sort of having the facility out for the last couple of months. You're uh, probably banking it up now with all these schools they're ready to go, okay, open the gates and let, let us in. Well, it's not been too bad. We did pick a time that was at the end of the little athletic season Mm. and before the really busy time with the Winter Carnival started. So it typically is Term 2 and Term 3 that's really busy busy for that, and so not so much Term 1. So we, again, picked that time, Mm. obviously. So hopefully they're not too banked up. Hopefully they're the normal course of events that we've got going through there. So the million dollars, or the million and a half dollars, whatever it is there, that you've sort of still got sitting there, is that, is that money now still sitting there for uh, for the same purpose, for future down the track, Barden Park uh, issues? or No, we, we don't like to have money just sitting around not being used effectively. Yeah. So that money basically is in that same budget area right. in our parks and land care. Okay. And we just use that in you other parts. You redistribute that. that money Correct. now. Correct, exactly okay. right. Yeah. Oh. So again, then we'll start building up money again over the next 10 years mm-hmm. ready. So in 10 years' time when that track will be resurfaced again. And 10 years is generally the time frame that's seen for maintaining the international standard. When someone runs mm-hmm. there, they can say, I qualified for an event because the look at the time I ran there in Dubbo, for example, mm-hmm. on that international standard track. The other thing that we do is when we do have people that go down there and train, and there are many different groups that do go down there and train, mm. we actually put some little signs there to say, please avoid lanes one and two. You can imagine when you look at the overall usage of a track, mm. long distance events, you might be in your lane for a period of time or you might start mm. across the track, but then you cross over. And obviously, in, when you're running in that event, you're staying as close to lane That's one right. as possible because yep. you want to run the least distance. Now, for a, a 200 metres or a 400 metres, you might be staying in your lane, but Outside of that, when you get the longer distances, you're mm. always running in those first lanes. Mm. So that's why those ones obviously wear out sooner. When we have training down there, we say you don't have to be in lane one for your training. Mm. You can train in Absolutely. further lanes yeah, out. Yeah. So please train. And, and again, we normally put little, not barriers, but mm. little signs, that type of thing up there, just to say to people, start in lane three. And, and we figure that we're not going to then put all that wear and tear on lane one. So hopefully... Another 10 years' time, we haven't got patches worn through and we're ready to, to go with it again. Well, I'm going to be heading down there on Thursday, actually, to have a bit of a look around. Uh, there's a school carnival on that it, uh, I'll be involved in, so I'm going to go down and have a bit of a look at it. Go and have a close look at the track and see what well, you think. See if you think the I'll, I'll see if my well. times are improved as well. <laughs> now, I saw a little bit of this about uh, during the week, actually. Um, because we keep seeing information about the progression of electric vehicles uh, across our community, and and I suggest probably one of the, the big thing which most people uh, tend to sort of question about the rollout of EVs 
is, of course, the charging network, the charging stations. So are there going to be enough of them? Uh, where are they going to be located? And, uh, you know, if, if it gets too busy, I have to wait for too long. So we've got a few charging stations here in town. We've, we seem to be going OK with that. But are we about to see more? Is that what sort of the plan is here? Definitely we'll see more and more. And council can sometimes be a little bit involved in this. We've actually got pretty good charging infrastructure in Dubbo at the moment. We've got at the Western Plains Cultural Centre mm. car park, we've got four Tesla superchargers there, and we've also got an NRMA charger there. So the NRMA chargers, that particular one's a 50 kilovolt, a right. kilowatt one. Yeah. So that's a, a reasonable, I, I put that in the fast charger mm. category. The Tesla ones are usually 150 kilowatt. Some of those are 250 kilowatt. Mm. So the NRMA one is, is quite a good one there. NRMA have approached us further because that's part of their rollout. They're basically saying one of the ways we think we can add value to our members is by having chargers out there. And so they started building them and they use them for free. So you could use them for free initially. Mm. They're now at the point where you've got to pay to use them, okay. but still you, you want them rolled out. Yep. And that's not costing government money. It's not costing council money. NRMA is funding that with their own funds. But again, mm. they'll obviously have a business model where mm. they finally start charging. So that's good in the centre of town, so you can park there, duck into the cultural centre, go get to the cafe coffee. there, yep. you can walk down to the main CBD, but one of the areas that's pretty important is to have charges on highways as well, mm. so the NRMA have actually approached us about putting in some more charges, and they're looking at 184 kilowatt EV charges at the Sirodin Cutler car park at the top of the hill. So oh, so in the, West Dubbo there? In West Dubbo, yeah. Yep. Just next to Club Dubbo. Yep. So you've got the Club Dubbo car park and you've got the little car park at the top. Yep. So you wouldn't need to drive down to the bottom, but at the top there. Right. The interesting part there is they would like some car parking spaces that they can paint or we can paint their electric vehicles only or electric vehicles charging mm. only. Mm. So you're kind of taking away some car parking there's nothing stopping a petrol car parking there. It really is a sign there to say this is designed for EVs. Mm. But if you had to, you could probably park there. But it is frustrating if you drive an EV and you pull up and mm. there's a petrol car park in a spot where yep. you need to park to, yeah, to yeah. plug in and charge. Yeah. So keep that in mind because what we'll do is they, they wanted some form of a lease to be able to say reserved for EVs. And so we'll charge them something for that. This will have to go through a, a council meeting mm. to finally resolve all of that. I personally don't see a problem with it, and I'm not sure if councillors are particularly concerned about it. The NRMA will make money out of this eventually. The NRMA are putting in all the infrastructure, and they'll pay council some amount of money, not an mm. exorbitant fee, but some amount of money to be able to say, yes, these spots are reserved for car for EV charging. So it's a, it's a win-win for the community. Mm. You're getting... More EV charges here. You're getting people driving on the Newell potentially saying, I'll oh, pull up here. Oh, while I'm here, I'll just duck into Club Dubbo and grab a counter meal or duck in and, and have a, a bit of a break while I'm charging up, for example. So mm. you're getting people stopping in the community and you're also getting potentially Dubbo people if they need to, but most Dubbo people will charge from home. But as we get more high-rise living, more townhouses, that type of thing, you might need some of those charges as well. Mm. So this will go through your council meeting at some point in the near future. Again, I can never tell you exactly yep. which way councils are going to vote on things, but it seems to make sense to me. They'd like a, a five plus five lease term, five years with a five-year option, and they'll they'll pay some fee for that. I'm sure it won't be exorbitant, but there'll be some fee associated with it. Actually, it's interesting. Uh, being over in Europe, they're, they're everywhere. The EV charges are at literally everywhere uh, in residential streets, um, in uh, you know, obviously the service stations have got them set up over there as well. They're uh, they're in public areas. Uh, they're in literally, literally in what seem like private areas. They are literally everywhere now. There's obviously a lot more EV vehicles sort of travelling around Europe right now. Um, is is there a role apart from what we're talking about here? Is there a role that the Dubbo Regional Council can play in actually setting up more themselves? Is this something that potentially down the track that you would see council itself being involved in setting up their own? EV operations, like the charging ports? We have done that already. Okay. So there was some money that was available from the state government, and we recognise we've got good charging network in Dubbo. Again, those charges I mentioned, in addition to that, you've got some motels that have put charges in, so there's a mm. number of places you can charge in Dubbo, but we did see a weakness in Wellington. So when there was some state government funding available, we actually put an application in for that, and we were given some money to do that. So we installed, and we're going back probably a year, maybe a year and a half ago now, 
We installed charges at the Wellington Library, and we also installed charges at the Wellington Caves. Okay. And for some people, it's a very convenient location. If yep. you're a tourist and you're driving along, you'll sometimes look for where charges are, mm. and then maybe you'll see what's there to visit while you're charging up. Mm. Wellington Caves made a lot of sense. Oh, I could go and plug in and charge up while I go in and look at the caves. Fantastic. Now, we set those charges up to be free. They're not fast charges. They're... Well, they're not superchargers. Mm. They're charging those ones there from memory are only about 7.2 kilowatts or they might be 11 kilowatts. Mm. So significant lower than the ones I talked about before at, mm. at 50 or 150 or 184 kilowatts. Mm. But that's still not too bad. To give you an idea, they might charge your car at the rate of about 70 kilometers per hour. So it might add 70 kilometers of range per hour. So if you're pulling up at somewhere like a uh, caves, a mm. destination, it might be quite considerable. You might spend two or three hours there looking mm. through the cave network, looking at the the whole experience there, looking at, at the exhibition we've got there. So charging up for a couple of hours, you're adding a reasonable amount of charge. The ones that are the what I would call the superchargers, yep. the idea of those is there to plug in for five or ten minutes to top up to keep going on your journey. So yeah, right, a bit more okay. like a petrol station there. Yep. So we've got them at the library, and again, they're good. Plug in at the library. That's right in the CBD of Wellington. Then you go Mm. and spend some money at a cafe or go and look at some various things around the the centre of of Wellington there. So that's good from that perspective. And we saw that as being a hole in the network, if you Mm. like, in Wellington. So if we see other opportunities come up, we'll potentially take advantage of those. But we're also quite happy when a Tesla and and Mm. NRMA, etc. Absolutely, yeah. Come in and do their supercharged setups. Yeah, Mm. fantastic. Now, the Western Plains Cultural Centre, well, look, they always hold a huge variety of ex- exhibitions. Uh, we've talked about uh, a number of them over the course of the time. So what's the latest one that's uh, opening up or just so- suddenly opened up uh, literally yesterday, I'd suggest? Yeah, Saturday afternoon. I mm. had the pleasure of opening the latest Waste to Art exhibition. And oh, I, you love this one. This I one's do. your favourite one, isn't it? I just yeah. think it's fantastic and they have a different theme each year and I don't want to say that this one wasn't the best one ever. It was fantastic and it's always different. Mm. But there was one many years ago that I did love in particular just from my IT background. Someone had used motherboards and built a map of Australia right. out of motherboards. So they basically joined all these motherboards together and they're, they're green, so they yeah. kind of used some of the green colour of the motherboards and built this whole map of Australia. And I look at that one, I love that one. So it's probably my favourite one that I've seen out of all the ones I've seen. Can- Not... Can I try to top one for you now? Sure, sure. Here we go. This is our little one-upmanship sort of situation. Tate Modern, London. All right. So, sorry to sort of uh, flex on that one there for you. <laughs> <laughs> we went in there. The best uh, display that I saw there was uh, some artist had turned around and got all these old radios. Remember the old radio systems? Yep. From the, the, the great big box ones through to the little ones you probably have sitting beside your bed. Had them all set up there in this huge tower. And they're all operating, so you had this sort of white noise sound happening around yeah, wherever right. you'd go, and the little things are flashing. And that it was amazing; it was incredible. But of course, waste to art. Yeah. So, how many radios would they have had there? Oh, I would look. There's probably a number that probably, if I bothered to sort of stop and have a look and read what the whole point was of it. But uh, uh, I would suggest, top of my head, three or four hundred. Yeah, right. At least, yep. M- maybe more. Yep. You know, uh, that's probably just even a rough guess. And it was that's huge. Got to be better than putting them in landfill. Absolutely, that's right, yeah. And it was probably the main exhibit there, apart from a Yoko Oni exhibit, which I don't really want to talk about. It was pretty ordinary. (laughs) So the theme this year is the year of packaging. So we encourage people to take any discarded products utilised in packaging. So soft plastics, bags, bubble wrap, cardboard, styrofoam, anything at all Mm. that you could use for your packaging. So use that. And again, the, the... some of the data that I had there when I did the opening on, on Sadavo talked about the fact that 91% of all packaging at the moment is sent to landfill. So, is that right? yeah, wow. so there's a lot Still. that goes there. So, mm-hmm. you, you get your new gadget, you bring it home, you open the box, it's all packaged beautifully because it doesn't mm-hmm. want to get damaged. Mm-hmm. And then you go, oh, oh, what do I do with all this packaging mm-hmm. now? And so, unfortunately, 91% does go into landfill. And just to give you an idea of how much, we Aussies throw away 1.9% million tonnes of packaging each and every wow, year. That would not surprise me after seeing what I do after most grocery shops. Well, that, just even that, you're yeah. exactly right there. Now, waste to art is not going to solve that problem. But one of the ideas of waste to art, or, or I think there's, there's dual ideas. One is to say, look at how clever people mm. are in taking 
general waste and doing something clever mm. with it. Mm. The radio station you gave, yeah. the, the example of motherboards, etc. But the other thing is just to make people think about it. When you mm. look at this artwork or these artworks and you look around and see what people have done and be very clever with them and then you start thinking about it going, yeah, there is a fair bit of waste mm. in there. What can I do about that? Mm. How can I reuse some of that packaging? Because, mm. again, you don't want to buy your device and get it home and it's no. going to crack screen, so you want the packaging there, but mm. how can I better utilise that But they're packaging? ingenious, some of these artists. They're oh, absolutely ingenious, clever. what yeah. they do with it, yeah. So I won't give any hints away as to what's there. I want to encourage people to go down and have a look. Yes. And I would encourage that. It's a free exhibition. Western Plains Cultural Centre, open now. It's officially open, opened yeah. on Saturday, so it's officially open there, ready to go. Go and have a look. And again, I, I do love the ingenuity of people. Sounds like a reason to get down there this week. Now, I noticed recently that uh, ICAC uh, handed down some findings that relate to some, some serious corrupt conduct involving some employees of the Inner West Council, the Transport for New South Wales, Downer EDI, while they're acting as uh, contractors for Transport for New South Wales, and also Sydney Train, so there's some ma- major, major operations there. Does, well, does any of these findings, or any of these findings have any impact here uh, with us here in town? Not specifically, but you always want to be aware when you see something that happens, ICAC, corrupt mm-hmm. conduct, whatever it might be, you always want to just look at your own systems and have a think about what we do to make sure you're not leaving holes open. And it's not about have we got corrupt conduct right now today. Mm. That That's obviously one part of it. But another big part of it is have we got systems that would be easily corruptible. Mm. Now, you remember that we had the discussion last week. Yes, only about last the decision-making week, processes. Correct, yes. about yeah. the fact that any DA that is going to be refused by council needs to come to council a council meeting. Mm. Mm. And and I explained at that time that I'm not thinking any of our staff are corrupt, I'm not thinking mm. any of our councils are corrupt, but the process there, if you're a developer and there was a potential for corruption, that would make it very difficult. Mm. So you want to have a system in place that is as has as little opportunity for corruption mm. as possible. Unfortunately, what I've found when I've read various ones like this report, now this is a 192-page report, I've only skimmed this report at so this stage. So you read it, did you? Yeah, well, <laughs> I had a look because I wanted to actually just yeah. get a bit of a feeling for it. And I, the conclusion I've had from previous findings that I've, I've read and information I've read mm. is almost any system is corruptible if you have people who are willing to be Corrupted. Corrupted, yes. Mm. Yeah. And what you want to do is make it so that you don't just have a single point of corruption because that's easier for one for one corrupt person then mm. to say, oh, I can just do this mm. and that'll be okay. And that whole idea that I've talked about before with DA to be refused by council, then you're talking about corrupting six councillors. Mm. Trying to corrupt one individual, whether it be a councillor, whether it be a staff member, someone might think they've got a bit of a chance to corrupt that individual. But when you've got to go and say, you've got to find six councillors that A, mm. you can corrupt and B, aren't going to report you mm. during the potential to corrupt them process, mm. gee, you, you want to be pretty confident that you can do some stuff there. And I hope mm. most people say, it's not worth it, how about we just do the right thing? This actually sounds like uh, me sitting down last night or yesterday uh, watching what happened over there in America with a certain <laughs> Mr. Trump. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, don't Goodness me, don't that. start me, he says. <laughs> don't start me. So they actually found that there were some control failings in the procurement process. So mm. essentially what happened in this scenario was that there was some confidential information disclosed to suppliers, which then allowed them to put prices in that were um, going to give them the right outcomes, if you Mm. like. So basically, there's nothing stopping anyone from disclosing confidential information apart from your own morals and ethics. Getting a supplier to then put a price in based on certain things there. So you you want to put things in place to make sure that there are multiple people involved at Mm. each step along the way, I suppose. So we'll have a look at this in more detail. We'll make sure that we've got as many steps in place as possible to minimise the potential for corruption, but again, it is always there. There are people there who are corruptible, yep. and sometimes they will be approached and they'll think this seems like a good idea. Sometimes mm. they'll be the ones doing the approaching for whatever circumstances they may be in. And the other thing about that is it actually protects, having good systems in place protects those people who are doing the right thing. 
Correct. You know what I mean? That's like, exactly right. It, it's, it's not just about always trying to maybe get those who are potentially corruptible. It's, it's also making sure to protecting those who are doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. It's, mm. it's one of the things that when people say, oh, I know that Jimmy took something there, that happened. First of all, you say, well, show me the proof. But B, if there are steps in place that mm. would make it Impossible. near impossible yeah. for that to happen, you can say, well, I'm pretty confident Jimmy didn't do that because yeah. – here are the steps in place. And I suppose the biggest thing for us as a council is in relation to tenders, Yes, a process with tenders and keeping the level of tenders at a level that's reasonable. Yeah. So, for example, now it used to be the rules of local government used to be anything over $150,000 had to go out to tender, full stop, mm. no questions. Some of the very large councils said $150,000, that's, that's nothing. Mm. Our budget's... Half a billion dollars. We spent one hundred and fifty thousand dollars on lunch money. Well, mm. maybe not quite that bad, but, <laughs> but they found yeah. that that was unworkable because it mm. added a lot of administrative overhead. So they lobbied, and eventually was agreed to by the state government for councils to set their own limit on when they needed to go to tenders. Mm. Logically, in my mind, you still want to have it at a low enough level that you're capturing big projects. But if you and there's nothing stopping you doing this, if you raise the level, if you said you can go out to tender only when it's above a million or mm. only when it's above two million or there's no limit. And you could do that. Mm. And councils have been known to do that in the past where there's no limit. Then you make it where the staff can make decisions on that. Mm. And if you had a system in place where, oh, Mark, we're pretty busy at the moment. Mm. We've got this tender out. Can you make the decision on yeah, that? just if Mark to sign off on that. Then suddenly mm. one individual, I'm looking at these tenders, gee, that one's not going to get it because he's not the cheapest. But no, oh, mm. I could ring that guy, you know, mm. and I could say, "Look, I'll tell you a bit of information, but if you get the job, I need ten grand for my troubles." Yeah. And so, if one person is in that situation, there's potential, mm -hmm. and that's that's the risk you have, I suppose. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So anyway, we'll read that in more detail. Our staff have a good look through that as well, yeah. and see if there's anything we need to change in our current systems, just to learn from. Failings at another council. Uh, sounds good. Now, we still know the Dubbo's a very popular destination to move to, Matt, don't we? And uh, now over the course of time, there's been lots of different activities uh, happening with major builders or developers um, around the place. Uh, is any of this major, you know, I suppose, any of these groups, are they out there supporting housing here in Dubbo? We've had a couple of meetings, actually one last week and I've got another one coming up this week which I think are pretty exciting. I, I can't say the company names. These mm -hmm. are companies that are going through a process. But the exciting part about it is we've got a number of different options they're looking at. To give you an idea, one of them actually certainly involves 3D printing. So they're looking at right. getting some houses built faster. I, I met with one of them, had some of our staff in the room as well to go through the process of how they actually lodge a DA that will conform with a 3D printing process. So again, that's not corruption that's just giving them some information <laughs> that's discussion that's discussion that's right and that's it's also right. much harder in that particular room yeah, yeah. we had four staff members and myself and the particular developers mm. or the builders involved in that one so again pretty hard to, to have that's corruption right. i'm not going to report you right okay. <laughs> that many people but but the good part about it was we needed to give them information to say we know how we can do approvals we know what you've mm. got to put in for a DA that if you want to use 3D printing, here's the steps to take. So they've mm. got some individual projects they want to look at that they're already doing. In That's fact, exciting. they've already got approval yeah. to go through and do that. They just need to go through and work out how they put the steps together. So a bit of advice around that. That same group was looking at some other housing. I, I took them for a drive around Dubbo to show them other locations where they can buy. And it's not always just council land. I, yeah. I don't mind who they, what land they buy. There's lots of developers out mm. there. But the other part that was exciting about that particular concept was they're also looking at some larger, they want to do some sort of development of maybe 50 or 60 townhouses, maybe okay. shop top housing, that type of thing. Yep. What land is available for that? So I showed them some different ones that are coming up from, again, council and other developers. Yep. What got me a bit excited is I said, oh, how long is that one away? Oh, look, that one might be 12 months. No, no, we need it sooner than that. Yeah, so right. they want to try and solve the problem sooner yeah. than that. One area that I do love the idea of, and we just went out through an AI process for it, yeah was a bit of land in Talbragar Street opposite the swimming pool. I yeah, now saw something about that advertised during the week. So what's happening there? So that was land that was bought back in about 2019 mm. by the last council. that's council-owned land, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and I did actually speak to a former councillor and said, 
that $3.2 million you spent on the land on Tobago Street, why? Mm. What was the purpose? And the answer was a bit vague. This councillor wasn't exactly sure. They said, oh, maybe we thought it would be good at an increase in value, a bit of land mm. speculation. Not mm. sure if that's the best thing for a council to be mm. doing. Maybe a bit of overflow car parking from the swimming pool. Mm. Oh, really? For the number of carnivals you have through the so year. It wasn't really a set plan, so to speak. There wasn't really a set plan, but, yeah. but the, the vague plan didn't sound great. Again, okay. I, I must admit I'm not the biggest fan of spending $3.2 million a on a money. bit of overflow car mm. park for a swimming pool that has a big carnival a few times a year. Mm. So we went through an EI process. We got values that came back to council. I can't mention those numbers, mm. but I can say that councillors decided that they weren't happy with any of those values compared to what we paid for that block of land, and then the values weren't enough to get us excited about it. So our job now is to look at what's the strategic purpose. That was the council resolution. Yeah. Said to our staff, can you work out some sort of strategic purpose for us as we continue to own that? It doesn't mean it can't be sold. In fact, mm. the strategic purpose may be develop it for more housing. That mm. could be a strategic purpose. But if someone else came along and offered money, then we could always go back to council and say, well, we didn't like these numbers. Here's a new offer that came out of the blue. Are we happy to sell it at that price? Now, mm. councillors can then decide whether to do that or not. We're not out there actively looking to sell it. But again, this mm. one just happened to come along and they said, we need about 1.2 to 1.5 hectares to build, again, townhouses, shop-top housing, etc. Yeah. And as I showed them various blocks of land. I showed them that one as well. I said, well, here is one that's suitable. Our resolution at the moment is not to sell it. Yeah. But again, if you send in an offer, then we could certainly look at that and we could take that back to council to see if councils were interested. But in looking at that, they actually like that block a lot because it's very close to train station, bus station, very close to CBD, close to the park, close to schools. Yep. In terms of building housing to solve part of our housing problem we've got where people want to move to Dubbo, that's not the end of the world in terms of no, solution. Absolutely not. And, and I think was this one uh, connected to the res? Was, was this no, no. Th- this to do with just the, res? the fact, just the fact that people are looking to move to Dubbo for a whole range of so, reasons. So this is like uh, setting up uh, some type of townhousing operation there, or you know, set up there in, in that area. So, so they're not sort of setting up there for fly in, fly out type. No, people. just the fact that they like the idea that it's close to the CBD. But again, there's other options okay. for them. And and I've got another meeting next week with another developer who has got the concept, in fact, he wants to do 60 houses that are all 3D printed just for the speed of construction there. Yeah, wow. And looking at different parcels of land around Dubbo where you you might be able to do that, maybe all in one, maybe in different parcels. But again, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of interest in Dubbo in development at the moment. And we've got good developers and good builders here. The thing that's been really hurting has been the interest rates. Mm. So the affordability of some of those housing that's been available in the past Mm. has been a bit tough for people to afford. The idea with this is that maybe some of these developers using different construction methods, like I said, maybe 3D printing, making it a bit cheaper, different types of construction, maybe different style of housing, different size housing yeah. to meet the market where that's, the market's that's, at. You know, I know uh, probably you know, 18 months, two years ago, we, we, we spoke about the fact that Dubbo needs to have a, a variety of options for housing. And and there was a bit of a you know, rhubarb, rhubarb sort of regards to that. But have a look and sort of see how things have moved just in that last you know, 18 months or two years. You know, the, the big development down there at the bottom of Church Street is already taking shape and it's looking fabulous down there. There's and I think most of those units have been sold How good's that? already off the plan. Yeah. So it shows there is demand out there Absolutely. for a different style of housing. Yeah, so there's obviously, uh, as you say, the demand's there. So it seems like there's quite a, a large amount of interest too by people to move into this type of sort of style of dwelling, the smaller type of townhousing developing, the unit type developments. Yeah, no, definitely right. Well, mate, we've got through another one, and it's time now for the Limerick of the Week. Well, what's it going to be this week? Well, my voice survived just yeah, throughout you did, the... You did well. Look, you, know, uh, you sound a uh, little less croakier than last week and <laughs> definitely uh, a lot less croaky than two weeks ago. So I would suggest you're on the improve. So what Thank have we you. got? So I thought the most exciting thing that happened this week was the CSU graduation. Oh, well, they, they, all those CSU graduates are well-deserving of a Limerick. So for the 47 graduates and for... Just the whole concept yes. of CSU being here in Dubbo. Here's my limerick. CSU grads in Dubbo did cheer. Their hard work had led them to here. With tassels now turned, their futures they earned. They'll go forth without any fear. I have to say, that's probably one of your best ones. I, 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 tassels are turned. Well, see, I like that. What a nice I, little turn of phrase. Because the whole idea, as you know, is yes. you hang your tassel over one side and then you move your tassel to the other side of your graduation hat. 
and I can't remember which way it goes. I think it goes to your right, doesn't it, after you graduate? Oh, look, I, I, it's too long ago for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought that that little subtle reference to uh, Tassel's turn, I'm quite proud of myself on that I, one. I think, as I said, I, I was uh, dutifully impressed by that sort of thing. Well done. Oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, folks, that wraps up again for another Straight from the Mayor's Mouth. Until next week, take care. Straight from the Mayor's Mouth with Matthew Dickerson from Dubbo Regional Council.